feel like sometimes life is really mental. Dude, that's actually a really good name for a podcast. <laughs> Even when you lose all hope, you go deeper than you've gone. Hold on till you can't no more. I didn't know what it really meant to be myself, never mind be confident in what it meant to be myself. I'm grateful that I had a lot of time without people giving a shit. Hey, beautiful human, welcome to the Really Mental Podcast, where we want you to know that no matter who you are, you're not alone. I just want to start off by saying, if you could please follow, like, subscribe, and follow us on socials, we would really appreciate it. And please remember to, if you can, give us a five stars on this because we really believe that uh, JP Sachs' story is worth that. We're really excited today to welcome him to the studio, the Really Mental Studio. Uh, We talk about embracing change. And I wanted to kick things off and ask you, Harry, what experience have you had embracing change, whether it be friendships or just life in general? The main thing I can think about when it comes to change is people coming in and out of my life and like different people at different stages of my life were there for me and then they weren't there for me. And I think I've learned that it's really important to let people go and to let people in because I think it's equally as important when you are living your life to just focus on yourself and the people will come in and out as they come all the time. And it will kind of be this cycle and you can't be afraid to lose people and you can't be afraid to gain people. And I think I've learned that and I've embraced that change and that ever going growth of having new and exciting people in my life that support me. What about you, Will? Well, I wanted to ask just on that, what does losing a person look like for you? Can you dig, dig into a time when you've lost someone that you've cared about or like they've, you've had to let them go and be their own person? Yeah, I think... Like I've had friends that we've had falling outs and they haven't been the kindest person towards me. And I've had to learn to remove them from my life because they don't serve me and they don't serve the relationship. And I'm not happy when I'm friends with them ultimately. And they're not a good friend to me. And I have to really remind myself that I'd rather be alone than have someone in my life that isn't going to look after and care about me and be a true friend. And that's a really hard thing because I hate being alone. Like I hate being by myself. But I think at the end of the day, you don't want to surround yourself with people who aren't good for you because at the end of the day, it will bring you down and it will make you feel less than you actually are. I agree. Uh, Well, I'm glad you shared that point and we're going to get into more of that in the episode with JP Sachs. We want to welcome him again, embracing change, an interesting topic. And I think that you'll learn something. If you do, please share this with a friend. All right, let's get into it. Just want to let everyone know that we have an Amazon AMP show every Sunday at 7pm PT and 10pm ET with amazing guests similar to the podcast. Please go check out the Amazon AMP app and follow us at Really Mental. Today we are joined with Mr. JP Sachs, an incredible songwriter uh, and singer, and he's on tour at the moment. He just released an album called Dangerous Levels of Introspection. Love the title. How are you doing, JP? I'm feeling great. I'm on an off day. I slept until 1 p.m. I'm I'm loving life. I'm getting to do what I love and I'm with people I love, so I don't have a thing to complain about. Love that. How is your mental health at the moment? I would say right now we're feeling pretty we're feeling pretty good. You know, the last 18 months, a huge part of my heart and soul was unavailable to me. So I, I'm just, I, I feel like I'm refilling a bucket that has been painfully empty. And I just, I love singing these songs with kind strangers. You know, it's, it's a pretty mystical thing to me still that songs that I've written from often the loneliest, most private parts of my life that have connected me to the parts of myself that scare me then get to be the thing that connects me to other people in this really beautiful way where I get to just show up and we're all singing these songs together and and finding that, you know, our our loneliest of moments are actually things that we share with people we've never met all over the world. That's great. Is there a moment throughout this tour or past tours where you've been like, oh, this is what I love? Almost every moment. I, I, I journal a lot. It's a it's a big part of you know me just feeling grounded is is making the time to journal. And my journals lately have been really redundant because they're all like, I fucking love this. I want to do this forever. I'm so grateful that this is my life. It's obviously been a grind 
for you. I remember listening to 25 in Barcelona and you were definitely a rising artist. A bit before then, say like five years ago, when maybe you didn't have as many people listening to your songs, was it that same feeling for you or was it like a frustration? You know, the the struggle always felt a bit more of like an adventure. I'm grateful that the shit that's happening in my career right now didn't happen when I was 19 years old. I have a lot of respect and admiration for some of the 19 year olds in music right now who, you know, are grounded and know who they are and know how to express who they are in a, in a confident way. But when I was 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, like I didn't, I didn't know what it really meant to be myself, never mind be confident in what it meant to be myself. So I, I'm grateful that I had a lot of time without people giving a shit. I have some life under my belt to have some credibility in, in speaking to what it's meant to feel my own feelings. How did you get to that place from being and growing up? Like, what were some of the things that you did and some of the things that you experienced that helped you get there? I've always loved the community around music. You know, there's a misunderstanding sometimes from up and coming artists that the quote unquote connections that matter in our career are like some dude at a record label or a publisher. It isn't that the connections and relationships that matter are just the colleagues, you know, the other people who are showing up at open mics. When I lived in Toronto as a teenager, I went to every open mic I possibly could. I knew where every open mic was on every night of the week, whether it be a poetry open mic or songwriter night. And I was, that's where I made all my closest friends. It's where I got inspired by other artists. And then when I got to Los Angeles, I did the exact same thing. You know, I would show up at these open mic nights and met incredible artists. I remember, I still think about it. Like there was this room, place called room five and they had a Monday night um, called Monday, Monday singer songwriter night. And I used to go every Monday and, you know, sing a couple songs. And there was this one girl who would always get up on the go the same night she would go and she would get up on stage and I'd be like, holy fuck, this girl's amazing. It was Phoebe Bridgers. Uh, oh, that's insane. And, yeah. And uh, it's, it's cool to just, you know, know that different paths go through similar worlds when you're, when you're pursuing this weird life that we're pursuing. So you really like to keep it with a tight knit group. Yeah. You know, I'll tell you a little story about why I, I like to keep it with a tight knit group. When I signed my first record deal, my my first and only record deal, we were in New York. We were going to have a celebratory dinner. And before the dinner, I was playing like a little showcase for a bunch of the Sony staff. And, you know, being the the performance obsessed human that I am, I was thinking solely about this little showcase, like thinking about the songs I was going to play, thinking what it was going to be. I didn't put any thought into the like celebration dinner afterwards. So I didn't invite anybody. I was just there with a bunch of, you know, now people I'm close to, but at the time, total strangers. And here, what's supposed to be like this big, like milestone moment for me, and I was just kind of unhappy at this dinner because I didn't have anyone to turn to and be like, Are you fucking seeing this? We did it. Without that moment of getting to turn to someone beside you and be like, Holy shit, it's happening. It doesn't really feel like it's happening. I thought a lot about that moment afterwards, and I, I just told myself I was never going to let an important moment of my life go unshared like that again. How do you find the people that you love? Along the way. I mean, some people I've known for 15 years, some people I've known for two. You know, sometimes you just got to take a bet on somebody and be like, you know what, you seem dope. Let's spend a lot of time together. And sometimes (laughs) you're wrong and sometimes you're right. And, you know, part of Part of holding on to the right people is also letting go of the wrong people. That's harder. But in order to have a community that really represents the things you care about, if someone isn't really, it doesn't really fit that mentality, like just the recognition of, you know, it doesn't mean they're a bad person, but maybe it means they're not the person that you want to grow with. And that's okay too. I want to take things back a little bit and ask, how did growing up in Canada and Toronto shape you as a person? So I've heard... Canada and Australia have a lot in common. I grew up about 45 minutes outside of Toronto in a small town called King City. I think there's a larger population of horses than there is of people in King City. (laughs) It's a good name. What a king. King City, it is a good name. But no, I mean, it was a small town. I went to a small high school. I went to all the schools I went to were really small. I didn't really find my community in high school. I think it's part of the reason that I latched on so tightly to the music community. Like I got bullied in high school and the things that I got made fun of for the most were being a ginger, being uh, being a singer and like being in choir and then being too sensitive. I've now built my entire career 
on being a ginger, being a singer, and being too sensitive. For some of my fans who are still in high school, who you know maybe don't feel like they're the cool kid or they're like the person people are wanting to hang out with the most, or maybe they're made fun of, or maybe that shit just you know gets difficult in all the way that high school can get difficult. Like, pay attention to the things people make fun of you for because they might actually end up being the thing that makes your life real beautiful. That is so true. I've never heard anyone say that, but even when I think about my high school experience, it was similar. Like the things that I would get um, outcasted for was like really working hard at music and like being really, really driven in that. And now we're here talking to people like yourself. So it's so like, I resonate with that so much. What about you, Harry? Throughout my journey, it's always been like modeling or like being in the fashion industry, not being like necessarily the most manly man that would be the things that people would bring up but that's also the same as JP the things that I've built my career on because that works for me and that is me and I think that at the end of the day you can only do what you love and what who you are and if people are going to judge you then they're not the right people to be in your life and they're just coming from a place of insecurity I learned have you ever found like because it is such a competitive industry and people are always trying to get ahead instances where people would try to be your friend but necessarily not always have your best interests at heart you can clock that in a first conversation and then usually don't want the conversation to go much further. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not a comp- very competitive person. Like, I also don't find competition in music to be all that useful. Sometimes it feels like a sport in that like we're on the same team, <laughs> but like we're not playing against anybody. If I think someone's fucking amazing who's doing something you know similar to what I'm doing, I want them to win. I want the kind of music I love everywhere. You know, there's different kinds of ambition and I think some of them are more useful than others. And I think that the sort of ambition to like be better than someone else to me in music is not the most useful. There isn't any one way to win in music. And if you start feeling competitive with other people, not only to to me, it's kind of like a in music, kind of a dark energy, but it also isn't all that useful because you start looking at how other people have figured out how to be themselves in the best way and how someone else is being themselves in the best way is not your way to be your best version of whoever you are as an artist. Around the time I got signed, like Someone You Loved was one of the biggest songs in the world. I love Louis Capaldi so much as a person and as an artist, but the fact that like that song was one of the biggest songs in the world made the industry believe in me more. The more people who who do what you do are winning and the more you do you find that community and you help each other like it's it's a rising tide raises all boats type of situation. So I'm interested as well JP like how do you move on from that because obviously Harry and I are like at that point where you you've moved on or you're trying to move on from high school and get into the big world and sort of separate yourself from those limiting like beliefs that people put you in. How do you do that? I mean, the world is a lot bigger than any one high school. If there was one or two people in your high school that shared your values, there's millions, millions of other high schools that had those one or two people, meaning there are tens of millions of those one or two people out there in the world. And now all those one or two people get to come together. And now you've got a community of millions of people and you don't need anybody else other than that. Getting out of a very small community into a very big world, there's all of those people are there and you just got to find them. And it's one of the reasons I'm grateful for music is I think music is is one of the ways that people are able to find, you know, their kindred spirits, you know, the people who they wish they could have grown up with. But, you know, you find them now and you recognize that, you know, there's not just one type of popular kid. You don't want to peak in high school. You want your peak. To be after school. It's definitely harder to, to stay on top if you're on top when you're 15. <laughs> I think not having a lot of friends when I was a teenager, like in class, forced me to figure out a relationship with myself. You know, not getting invited to parties meant I stayed at home and played the piano. Those moments with myself are like where I figured out what it meant to use art, to use songs, to use journaling, to enjoy my own company. And I I think it allowed me to to leave high school and, you know, move to Los Angeles, be out in the world with a a comfort level in my own head that I I may not have had if, you know, I was spending all of my time, you know, at the parties I didn't get invited to. 
Did you ever feel like you were alone or you weren't enough? Yeah, I mean, I definitely at the time wanted to be one of the cool kids. Like I wanted that, but I didn't know how. Like it wasn't, like I didn't know how to be charismatic at the time. Now, any sense of charisma I have comes from confidently speaking about my emotions and sensitivities and vulnerabilities and, you know, being open about the parts of me that scare me. You know, that's that's where my confidence comes from because I go like, no, I, I'm, I'm going to get up on stage in front of a thousand people and talk about the scariest parts of myself. And we're going to talk about it together and then I'm going to sing about it and we're going to sing it together. And there's such a strength in that. So you're in high school, you're playing music, and then you decide not to go to college. Can you talk us through that decision and what sort of went into that? Well, one, I was academically uh, insufficient. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't do very well in high school, so getting into college would have been a challenge even if I wanted to. I told my parents I was going to take a year off to travel, and I took nine. <laughs> I was saying this to Harry the other day, just real quick. I was like, you take one year off, and to my parents, it's like, that's his gap year. And then you yeah. take a second year, and it's like, well, second gap year. And then soon it's just like, okay, we've lost him. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly what happened. But, you know, I, I spent, I did travel. I spent three months living in Africa, which was amazing. And then got back and, you know, back to the open mics, back to doing concerts, doing projects with my friends. And then I had this opportunity to move to LA and it, I didn't think too much about it. Cause like, I didn't love what my life was in King City. Life wasn't the best at home. Like my parents got divorced when I was 17. You know, my mom struggled with addiction. I wasn't like itching to stay at home. Like wasn't the most comfortable environment, which, you know, I guess is a bit of a blessing because, you know, any discomfort that came with being in Los Angeles, the, you know, the newness and excitement of it and possibility was a lot more bearable because I didn't really love the option of <laughs> going back. Do you feel like your childhood was normal or do you feel like you had different experiences to kids your age? It wasn't until I was a bit older that I realized it wasn't normal. When I was a teenager, my mom really struggled with alcoholism, um, which had an effect on my life. My mom died last year. So sorry to hear that. Yeah, I appreciate that. But before she died, you know, she was was not drinking as much. You know, her and my dad were divorced. She was like finding you know some of her own joy in her life, and and her and I were able to have a conversation about you know how those you know five years of my teenagehood where she was drunk all the time, like affected me, affected, you know, the way I can have relationships, the way I deal with conflict, the, the way I internalize my emotional experience. And it, it was really a breakthrough for us. And I'm really glad that we had those conversations before she died because, you know, we had the beginnings of a different relationship. I wish we could have had more of it because, you know, she was getting better and I was able to actually share with her those things. I didn't realize there's something I had in common with others until I went to this, uh, this Al-Anon meeting. It's like Alcoholics Anonymous for the family members of alcoholics. Everyone was going up there and not so much talking about the alcoholism itself, but talking about how learning to be in, in like a relationship, you know, with a parent or with a brother, or with someone who did struggle with alcoholism affected the way they went about their other relationships. I hadn't made the connection in, until I heard all of these people saying the same thing. Like, you know, I, I don't know. I don't trust myself to say the wrong thing in a conversation. Like, I, I can't let myself get angry because they'll always one up it. You know, I always have to be the mature one. I always have to like compartmentalize my emotions because if I say the wrong thing, they're going to fly, fly, fly off the handle. So I have to like intellectualize my whole emotional experience. And it's something I have done my whole life. And something I, I, I think the silver lining of it is having to be so hyper analytical about what I was feeling because I didn't want to say the wrong thing and, you know, cause, you know, her to leave for four days or like get violent or whatever it was. I do think it's part of the reason I'm so hyper analytical about my emotions in the songs. I do think it's part of, you know, how my brain does that. But, you know, in falling in love now, you know, as a young adult, keeping all of your emotions to yourself and not wanting to show anyone any feeling you haven't figured out yet is is a way to keep yourself pretty closed off. How do you think your experiences impacted your view on love? You know, I think whether it be because of our upbringing or whether it be just because learning love as a man in a, in a world inundated with the glorification of toxic masculinity, like it, it's hard to unlearn 
this idea that loving someone as a man means showing up, you know, strong and put together and never vulnerable and just like this rock, all of those ideas, you know, which were certainly like in my head and still are like something I need to challenge all the time, you know, and in, in my previous relationships, like I, I really was afraid to show my partner any part of me that scared me because I, I would think like, you know, I love you and, and why would I want to show you a part of me that's hard for me to deal with? That'll be hard for you to deal with. Like, why would I want to do that? Like, it felt loving to keep them from that part of myself. But I think in truth, it's actually not so much love as it is just lack of trust. And that what's more loving is to trust someone with the parts of you that scare you when they aren't figured out. That's powerful. Actually, I want to, if you're okay to talk about it, I'm very interested in terms of getting perspective on someone passing. It's something, fortunately for me, touch wood, I haven't had to experience. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you sort of took away from that that you could share for us, just Harry and I? God forbid if it happens, let yourself feel it whenever you do. Because the more you try and stop yourself from going through it, the longer it will take to get to the part of grieving which actually feels beautiful, the part of grieving which actually makes you feel close to someone. Because grieving is it's it's longing to be close to that person again and, and you can't but when, once you get past the most painful parts of it you kind of become grateful for the grief because it's when you feel close to them again and i wish i'd let myself feel it more immediately because now i like have all these blocks and when i try and let myself go there when it's it's hard to actually feel it my mom died i was four days later had a headline show in Toronto. And then four days later, I had a headline show in Los Angeles. And then you know, a week and a half after she died, I was flying to Europe to tour with Len and Stella. And it was just like life just kept going. And you know, she didn't want to have a funeral. So we respected her wishes. But respectfully, I think she was wrong. I think funerals are important for a reason. I think it like gives you that moment of pause. You know, in, in Jewish culture, there's something called sitting Shiva, where you like you know, are supposed to, I don't remember how many days it is, but basically the family is supposed to like do nothing for a certain period of time. And people just come to the house and it's just all about that grieving process. And I think those traditions exist for a reason. And I kind of neglected them. Um, and I wish I hadn't. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that. And I mean, I think I, a question I have coming off of that is like something Harry and I have been speaking about recently is this concept that like, what would you do in your last 24 hours on this earth? Mm -hmm. And something that I came to is like, I would go to the people I love and say, I love you. Like, thank you. Does that sort of realization come to you and be like, damn, maybe I should be like doing something different every day. Or is it just like, you're still processing it? It's a good question. I think if I was told that 24 hours, I would, uh, I'm right now with eight of my favorite people on tour. So I would give them all a big hug and like maybe spend like an hour, hour and a half with them. And then I would get on a flight to Los Angeles and go back to my, to my people I love most and, you know, cuddle on the couch and, you know, maybe there's like a short live stream performance and then I'm just with my family. I wanted to bring it back to what you said earlier, JP, about your mom and your experiences being a kid. How did you deal with that? And what steps did you put in place to kind of like cope with those things? Cause they're very hard things to go through. Therapy helped. I started going to therapy once a week, which I really, I really valued. I started talking about it with my friends really openly. That sort of pain, that sort of abrupt change, you know, it it forces you to grow. So I thought about some of the things we're talking about a lot. I read books about it, went to therapy, those conversations with friends, and then, you know, when I finally did meet somebody that I was excited about again, there was a lot of things that. I came into that with that I'd never come into a different relationship with before, where I really was prioritizing like not just not just being the partner they needed but also being the person I wanted to be in that relationship and being fully open even if it meant saying things doing things that made us you know weren't just about you know smooth sailing like even if it meant leaning into some conflict because it was important for our sincerity what are some of the things you learned that make you a better partner one of them was like acknowledging that being a good boyfriend means being myself, not just being who I think she needs. I used to do that all the fucking time. I like, I really liked being loved. I'm like, I'm perceptive. I'm empathetic. 
You know, I, I can tell who you need me to be. So I'm going to be that and that'll feel good because then you'll love me. So true. I'm going to be who I am and who I am is supportive and nurturing and empathetic, but I'm going to be who I am and I'm going to focus on what that means. And if that isn't who you need me to be, then I have to accept that maybe this isn't the relationship I'm supposed to be in. But if it is, then I just get to spend my life being exactly who I am. And then that's who you'll love. And that's a hell of a lot easier and more sustainable than, you know, me just trying to, you know, fit into what I think is the right way to exist in this relationship. You write a lot of music that is talking about your experiences and the hardships that you've gone through. I wanted to know what are some of those experiences that you write about and what's the hardest one you've been through? The most painful experience of my life was definitely losing my mom. I've written one song about it. It's the last song on the album. It's called Sing Myself to Sleep. And I have not ever actually played it on stage. And I'm not sure I will. I can use the excuse that I don't have enough time in the set to play every song. But that song would be hard for me to play live. But I knew it was important for me to write. Because one, just for myself, having that, having that moment immortalized in a song meant I knew it was there if I ever wanted to go back to that feeling myself. And also, I just, I don't think I would have been able to make an album that accurately portrays what it's felt like to be me over the last five years if I didn't include that feeling. It would have felt incomplete without it. But that doesn't mean I'm like listening to that song very often or playing that song very often. How long did it take you to write that music? It took me about a year to write that song. It took a lot of journaling, a lot of like sitting down to try and write it, but then not really feeling like it accurately represented what I wanted to say. And to me, it's like, if that song was not the right feeling, then it it felt like disrespectful to the emotion, to the grief. Like I really wanted it to be right. And then, you know, I was in a room in Nashville with two people I'd never met before. And I was playing these chords on a, like an old synthesizer. And Audra May, uh, who was in the room, was me, Audra May, and uh, Mike Elizondo. And Audra goes like, those chords kind of sound like a lullaby. And I was like, you know, I actually had this idea for to write a song that felt like a lullaby called Sing Myself to Sleep About My Mom and then told her some of the lyrics I had in mind and she just cried. And then we wrote the song in 45 minutes and recorded it on just that synth and Mike played some guitar. And then we got into his old like Ford truck and he took us a ride around uh, <laughs> the countryside of Tennessee. Do you feel you have to go through experiences to write about them? Is that how you write? Yeah, I have yet to write anything that I haven't gone through. Every every one of my songs is is a real experience. I haven't figured out yet how to speak sincerely to an emotion I haven't had. My own experience is the only thing I feel like I have an authority on for the moment. You know, maybe like as a grow up as a writer, like I'll feel more confident like telling a story that is someone else's. You know, a lot of my favorite writers are able to do that, but I I, I haven't I haven't gotten there yet. How do you get yourself to a point where you're so comfortable sharing your emotions to such a big audience of people? I do think I have a little bit of an advantage in that I get up on stage, say vulnerable shit and people clap. You know, that is not a standard relationship with, you know, opening up about your insecurities. Usually there isn't such an immediate positive gratification that comes from. that. So I do think, you know, to anyone listening to this, like, I don't think you should expect yourself to just be able to come right out and say all the shit that scares you and have it like fly off your tongue without any fear I, i've like for a long time learned taught myself how to do that and have, have got a lot of positive reinforcement in doing it i do think whether whether you're singing about it on stage talking about it or just talking about it with a boyfriend a girlfriend a wife a husband a brother a sister a parent a family member a friend whatever it is you know whether there's a round of applause or not there is still an impact to what you allow yourself to feel, but also what you allow other people to feel comfortable in and share when you do it first. I, I'm still surprised, like pleasantly surprised by what people feel comfortable in if I show them that I'm comfortable in those parts of myself also. And I, I think that, you know, the more we can just recognize that the shit that we're embarrassed about is literally everyone else's experience also in some way or another gets a little less embarrassing. People think being an artist is sometimes an exercise in feeling like you're exceptional or special in some way. But I think uh, my favorite thing about being an artist is the recognition that I'm extremely basic. 
it's not that I have any sort of special experience to share that is different than anyone else's. I'm having the same fucking human experiences as mostly everyone else. I just happen to be able to articulate them in music. If they weren't an experience that we were all having, then like they wouldn't connect us to one another. Like none of the shit I'm talking about is like some unique, special thing that is just for me. I'm a basic human living a basic human experience who happens to be able to talk about it in songs in a way that brings us together. And, and I don't know, I, I like that reminder because it's just the thing. It, it's not like I have to come up with something like fucking brand new or like real exceptional to talk about for it to be meaningful. It's like, you no, know, I just have to talk about exactly what it feels like to be myself and trust that what it feels like to be myself is probably not all that different than what it feels like for most people being themselves as well. It sounds like as well, you've learned the art of sort of trying to get out of your own way as well, because I think that's a real differentiating factor for you if if you can think like that, because everyone else, I think, especially in this age, is trying to do more rather than do less and just simplify everything. Um, So I think that's beautiful. You can do that. My question that comes from that is after having a song like If the World Was Ending, does that change you mentally having a hit song like that? Or do you just go about business regularly? I think if I'd had a hit song that was um, trying to be a hit song, it might have confused me because then I'd be like, oh shit, like I got to do something like this because I liked that kind of success. So if I want to get that success, then I have to like stretch in this way again. But if the world was ending was just another song that I wrote, like from the heart, right out of my journal. I didn't go about that song all that differently than any other of the songs on my album. I wrote it with one of my favorite songwriters of all time. It wasn't like it was an outlier, you know, amongst the music. I made. So to me, it's encouraging that I just have to keep telling the truth in my songs. I have to keep writing. And, you know, I trust that, you know, eventually one of those feelings, one of those songs will resonate in the way if the world was ending did again, you know, maybe that'll be a song I put out in three weeks. Maybe that'll be a song I put out in two years, but no amount of success to me would justify like compromising, just putting sincerity first in these songs. And I'll keep doing that and trust that eventually one of them will resonate. What's a great next 12 months look like for you? What's a great next 12 months look like? Uh, Well, touring, honestly, as much as I can, because, you know, as much as it's fun to perform from my living room on a live stream, you know, usernames and emojis are not... uh, are not nearly as fulfilling as masked faces and conversations. So I just, I want to travel the world and I want to actually feel what it's like to be connected to others through these songs, you know, uh, performing for a hundred people singing along to me is a better feeling than any number of streams on a, you know, music service. Like I don't know how to emotionally internalize a stream count. So it's cool, but analytics don't make us happy, you know, we, we got into this, we got into art because we wanted to connect with ourselves and others. And you know, that's what I want to spend the next year doing. When's the time recently that you had something go wrong and how is that going to shape you going forward? I uh, almost cut off my thumb trying to cut up an avocado in the green room in Portland. <laughs> Cutting an avocado and it slipped and I had two stitches in my thumb. Oh my gosh. And then I had to go to urgent care right before the show and get the stitches um, and then rush back for sound check. I invited like kind of like dazed because, you know, I was freaked out about my thumb. I invited the the nurse who gave me the stitches to the show and she came. That's so cool. <laughs> Which made me very happy. Um, so I think the main area of improvement is I need to pay more attention when I'm cutting things because about five months ago, I got five stitches from trying to cut open a pre-cut bagel. Turns out you don't got to cut your pre-cut bagels. <laughs> So no more knives in the green rooms, just being slightly more careful with uh, my (laughs) physical surroundings. Another one is I occasionally take the piss out of my my friends, but I I have a habit occasionally of taking it slightly too far. The other day, I apologized to a friend of mine because I was making fun of her for dating this guy who looked just like this other guy that we know. And I just would not stop making fun of her for it. And then I felt really bad about it because I may have called this other person like, I referred to him as budget the other person. <laughs> and and then I like couldn't fall asleep because I felt so guilty about making fun of this person. Then the next day I woke up and apologized to everyone. They were all like, what are you fucking talking about? That was hilarious. But I still felt bad about it. And that's enough of a reason that I'd like to just have a little bit more discretion with where the line is with 
taking the piss out of someone. (laughs) (laughs) Well, man, thank you so much. So, so much for your time. Um, Really appreciate your vulnerability. And I think the thing which really I'm going to take away from this is some of the points you made um, around your mom passing. I appreciate you uh, opening up and sharing that because it's something I'm going to reflect on. Well, thank you for having me on. I appreciate you you both for um, prioritizing a platform where people get to be honest. And I do think three dudes talking about their feelings is is still a statement in itself. Definitely. Because I think normalizing these kind of conversations between just like groups of male friends does do some meaningful good in the world. Love that. Let's go. Got me hyped. Let's make some changes in the world. <laughs> Yeah, Will, so that was a really interesting episode with JP. I wanted to get straight into it and ask you, what was your biggest takeaway and something that you learned from that episode? Yeah, I found it really interesting. And I think that one thing that JP does really well is keeping his heart open. He's had lots of interesting experiences, whether it be because of the music industry or life, losing his mom, friends in high school. So I think that his ability to still be able to let people enter and exit his life is pretty inspiring. I would say one thing that I took away um, out of many things is his point about the world being a lot bigger than high school and bigger than the people there. And that there are a lot of people that will get you if you don't feel like they do where you are in, at your current school. I think that's something that I definitely could have heard when I was 18. 17, 18, 19, that would have really helped me. So I can relate to that with my own experiences because I feel like in my school, whilst I had friends, I didn't necessarily stick with like one group. And I sort of in that sense felt like an outsider. I spent a lot of time taking calls um, in between like classes. I would leave class to like take label meetings. And in that sense, I always felt like I was sort of, yeah, again, a misfit in that sense, and maybe a bit un- misunderstood. And so it was when I left school and I found other people doing that, that I really felt connected. So if there's one thing I want us to leave this episode with, it's the an inspiring message that you will find the people that are meant for you and please keep your heart open. Yeah, I think that's an amazing message, Will. I wanted to just say thank you for everyone that's made it this far and has listened to the whole episode. You're a real one. We love you. If you could please follow us on all socials at Really Mental Podcast and rate this podcast five stars on all different platforms that you listen to podcasts and give us a follow. That'd be amazing. We have an amazing guest next week, Salem Elise, and it's going to be a very exciting episode with her where we talk about a range of different topics to do with mental health and identity. Even when you lose all hope, you go deeper than you've gone. Hold on till you can't no more. Hey everyone, we have a really mental show on the Amazon AMP app. We're going to be hosting live conversations with some of your favorite guests, including some of the ones on here. So make sure you go follow us on the Amazon AMP app at Really Mental. And we want you to know that no matter who you are, you're not alone. So hopefully we'll see you on Amazon AMP at 7 p.m. PT, 10 p.m. ET every Sunday. All right, see you then, beautiful human. I just want to end this episode today, Will, by like talking directly to the audience saying like, if you guys are struggling, Will and I aren't like professionals in this field. We're just telling our experiences through stories and kind of just sharing what we've been through. But if you are really struggling, we do highly suggest going to see a therapist and professional help because they will be the ones that can really help you in your situation. Of course, feel free to share your stories with us and DM us. Um, we want to know what you're going through, but make sure you take the time to speak to a professional because that's going to give you the most help. That said, we hope that these stories and the people we've spoken to can really help you on your journey to, to finding that right person, whether it's a therapist or that friend to talk to about it. Make sure you take the time to do that.